Hi, and welcome to this presentation. Today I will be presenting an investigation of a massive fire in a multi-story car park in Norway. My name is Ragnar Fjellgren Mikalsen. I'm a research scientist at Rice Fire Research in Norway. And together with my colleague, we have made this evaluation. We have looked at fire spread and contribution from electric vehicles in this project. But first, Rice Fire Research, for those of you who don't know us, we are a Norwegian fire resource uh, center. We are located in Trondheim, in the center of Norway, and we were established in 1934. We are an accredited test lab and inspection body, and our owners are 70% rice in Sweden and 30% Sintef in Norway. We are also the center director of FRIC, Fire Research and Innovation Center, as you can see the logo on the bottom here. And to the right, you can see a picture of our lovely premises in Trondheim. So the fire we will be talking about today, you can see the blue dot in the middle there, that is Trondheim, and the Stavanger Airport is in the lower, in the southwestern corner of Norway. And if we zoom in quite a bit on the map, you can find Stavanger Airport, Sola. And this is uh, an uh, uh, airport that is located 15 kilometers southwest of Stavanger city. It's an international airport has a heliport for transportation to and from offshore platforms, has around 82,000 arrivals depart departure a year and 4.51 million passengers. And you can see the airport strip in the center of the picture here. And to the left, you can see the terminal. And if you zoom on, in on the terminal, you can see that the terminal is located around the parking house that we are looking at today. Parking out the parking facility here is marked with A, B, and C, marking the three steps of the building process. And the fire started in building uh, step B. You can see the horseshoe shape around here and the lower right area here, you can see a white roof. This is the terminal building area. During the fire that started in part B of the construction, uh, there was a wind direction coming from south towards north, as you can see marked by this arrow here, and parts of building C collapsed. So now we will have a picture taken from around the top of this, pit, of this um, picture that you can see here, where you can see that the, the building nearest us here is building C, that was uh, partially collapsed during the fire. And on the day of the fire incident here, it was quite a special situation at this airport because the prime minister was actually on site that day. She was at the heliport. During the incident, the airport was closed for about a day. And the reason for the closure of the airport was that the local fire service at the airport uh, helped the local mun municipal fire service during the efforts. So let's have a look at the mitigation effort. The figure here is based on the event log that was made by the local fire brigade, the Rubelan Fire and Rescue Service. At uh, 3.25 in the afternoon, the first car starts burning. A few minutes uh, later, the alarm center receives the alarm. And a minute later, the fire service was dispatched. The first fire trucks left the stations at uh, 15.36 to 37. And at 37, a manual alarm button was activated in the parking building and the alarm bells were activated. At a quarter to four, the first two trucks from the fire service are in place. So around 19 to 22 minutes after the first car started burning. At the same time as this was happening, the airport control center receives a call from the heliport uh, regarding the fire, and the airport fire and accident service was dispatched. 
Uh, a few minutes after the fire had started, the vehicle type was identified to be an Opel Safira, i.e. not an electrical vehicle. And the first fire truck from the airport was in place after 19 minutes. The timeline on the last slide you can see on the top left here. And now we're zooming out a little bit to look at the mitigation efforts during the rest of the incident. So as we saw before, the cars, the first cars started burning at 3.25. Uh, at 27 minutes, all people are reported evacuated from the premises. At uh, 32 minutes after the incident started, so just before four o'clock in the afternoon, there was considerable smoke production. And after this, uh, 40 minutes after this, uh, there was a message uh, via the police that the building can collapse because of high temperatures observed. At 4.47, all units were told to exit the building and all units, yeah, all units were told to exit the building. And uh, just after five o'clock, parts of the building starts to collapse. And at 5.20, building three or building C that we saw before collapses. Uh, so this was in the afternoon on the 7th of January. And it, during the night until 8th of January, there was still a fire in the building and plenty of smoke at uh, 1.30 in a.m. in the morning or in, at night, and the next afternoon, the fire services returned to the station. And on the 9th of January at 12, there was observed some smoke coming from the third floor and some heat from the collapsed part. And at 2.33 on the 9th of January, uh, the incident was terminated by the fire service. During the event, there was a wind of around 11 to 19 meters per second. So the total incident duration was around 47 hours. What you can see here is a sketch of the building where X marks the fire start, green marks seemingly undamaged vehicles, pink marks damage to the construction, and the pink X marks collapse of the building. And on the bottom right, you can see the wind direction giving, given. And what we can see from this is that we clearly see a fire spread pattern or a fire fan going from where the wind is coming from and towards the other end. Specifically related to vehicles, the total number of vehicles involved in the fire, we don't know. Uh, the numbers vary, but it's approximated to a few hundred. And based on the availability of electric vehicles and hybrid, hybrid vehicles in Norway, and the fact that those driving to an airport is expected to represent a slightly higher amount of newer vehicles than old vehicles, we expect that there are dozens of electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles involved in this fire. In the very beginning, when the car, first car starts burning, after 11, 18 minutes, there was a notification to the fire brigade stating car on fire. And this is quite important because a notice of car on fire will give a quite different response than, uh, for example, a notice of building on fire. At 15 minutes after the fire started, there was heard a bang from an electric vehicle. And at that point of time, there was a, an estimated danger of fire spread to around three to four cars. At 16 to 18 minutes after the fire started, there was observed uh, flames, bangs are heard and several cars around fire. And after just before 20 minutes after the fire started, around 10 cars were on fire. Here you can see some pictures from after the fire. And <clears throat> yeah, what caused the fire to spread so rapidly? Well, during the fire, it was decided to change distinguishing tactics from using water to using foams. And it's not logged exactly when this decision was made. 
Uh, but we know that several of the vehicles in the parking facility had melting of their fuel tanks, which gave leakages and spilling and runoff of fuel. And the off-gassing from these leakages ignited fires in new areas. And by using foams as extinguishing measure, there was a lid made on top of the fuel, removing the off-gassing. And our evaluation suggests that perhaps they should have considered using foam at an earlier stage. However, of course, foam has a poorer ability to be thrown than water. Uh, Avinoid and so Avinoid is the airport owner and also the local fire brigade utilized the wind direction to apply the foam. And when they used foam, there was a good effect on extinguish, extinguishing the fire and eliminating the problem. And then they gradually began, began to take down the fire. And how did the electric vehicles in the parking facility contribute to the fire spread compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle? Well, observations during the fire indicate that the electric vehicles inside of the parking facility did not contribute to the fire development beyond what is expected from conventional vehicles. And this is based on visual observations from the fire brigade. And uh, we would have liked to conduct some further technical studies on the batteries from the burnt electric and hybrid vehicles to be able to evaluate whether or not the batteries from these were involved in the fire or not, and to try to compare this to um, the damage extent. However, this has not been possible due to a lack of funding. So, when it comes to handling, which fire protective measures were in place and what uh, was the effect of this? Well, here you can see a picture from the very start of the fire where the first vehicle is on fire. And so the question was, could other fire protective measures have led to a different outcome? So there was no direct alarm to the alarm central, and it therefore took actually eight minutes before the alarm central was notified. There was no uh, active fire safety measures, such as, for example, extinguishing systems, and handheld extinguishers were not used during the initial phase of the vehicle fire. The owner of the vehicle that started burning, uh, as I understood, uh, they had quite a few children with them, and so they prioritized to evacuate rather than to start um, extinguishing measures. Uh, during the evaluation, we found that there was a lacking incident action plan for the specific object here. Uh, and this made it challenges to, challenging to access for large vehicles. It was also challenging to find the fire hydrants um, they were connected to a private water system and therefore cannot automatically be located in the locating system of the fire service. And there was a long distance to the fire within the building from where the fire brigade was able to be localized on the outside, especially during the beginning of the effort. And so the first smoke divers who entered had a regular hose length of 50 meters. However, the distance to the fire was actually 60 meters. So they lost quite a lot of time here with having to go back and forward um, to depressurize the holes and lengthen the holes by 25 meters. We also uh, had a look at the environmental impacts from this incident. So what you can see in the picture here is the airport area. The uh, dotted uh, area is the uh, parking facility, the terminal, and some of the close by facilities. You have a sparsely populated area to the north, and you have a densely populated area, in, at least in Norway scale, to the right. To the or west of the uh, facility, you have the Sora Strand Nature Reserve, and you also have a water cleaning park that collects all of the any 
uh, runoff water from the airport area and goes through a water cleaning park. And then you have the outlet to the west of this again. So during the incident, there was a lot of extinguishing foam used, but we found that this led to a limited environmental impact. Based on chemical analysis conducted by Kobe, um, it was found that extinguishing foam did not add substantial amounts of PFAS during the extinguishing effort, but uh, the chemical analysis still showed PFAS content in all water samples, and this is links, linked to previous emissions at the airport. It was documented that there was an oxygen depletion as a result of extinguishing foam release, and this is considered to have led to a local toxic effect in the aquatic environment in the Sola Strand Nature Reserve, but not have a general negative impact on sea life in Sola Rica. But what we saw from gathering the documentation as part of this evaluation is that there is definitely a need for a stronger awareness of and focus on the use of extinguishing foams and to log the amount of foams used. And this is, for example, a requirement as I understood it from Sweden, but not in Norway. So here we should learn from Sweden. When it comes to the environmental impact of smoke, uh, during the early phases of uh, the fire, smoke from the fire was mainly not driven towards the terminal buildings lying uh, to the east, south and west, since the smoke was going mainly northbound. Uh, but the fire smoke did affect the evacuation of a nearby hotel to the north. Eventually, however, the wind turned in the direction of the more highly populated area to the east of the incident, and the population warning was sent out. Uh, but we see that there were quite, there were not many health consultations. There were 11 people sent to the emergency room and two in hospital. And uh, also based on the municipality's assessment of the incident, we think that the fire smoke had quite a limited health impact to the neighbors. And when it comes to which pollutants were in smoke and so on, this has not been analyzed in this evaluation. So did we find anything related to electric vehicles when in these environmental analysis? Um, water analysis of selected metals that are relevant for batteries in electric vehicles uh, did not show any lithium and low concentrations of cobalt. So this indicates that the batteries in electric vehicles did not contribute to pollution of nearby water resources. When it comes to the fire safety design and Norwegian building regulations, Norway has a performance-based building regulation and parking garages with more than one floor is placed in risk class two out of a total of six risk classes. And we have four different fire classes. And this building was placed in fire class three. However, the regulation states that fire class four should be used if uh, a fire, an incident can have particularly large fire consequences for life, health, environment, or society. And under society, we find infrastructure and airports. And this fire class, if it should have been in fire class four or fire class three, has been a big discussion point in Norway after this fire. As we saw before, different parts of the park, parking uh, garage here was built according to different, at different times, and therefore also according to different regulations. You can find det details on this in the report. Uh, we have focused on building step B and C, since building step A was not affected by the fire. And 
What is interesting here, you can see a picture here from the side of building step B and building step C. It's interesting that these buildings are designed using more or less identical fire safety design, um, but the execution is quite different. And so uh, it is quite important to avoid uncritical reuse of content from older fire engineering concepts when designing a new building. When it comes to the load bearing capacities of the parking garage, the pre-accepted performance level for the main load bearing system was R90. And for some circumstances, the performance level may be reduced to R15. So quite a shorter time span for the fire resistance, in other words. However, this is not applicable for the Sula case. However, the fire strategy uh, deviated quite a lot from the pre-accepted performance, having R10. When it comes to sectioning, here you can see an overview of the maximum area per floor in square meters allowed without sectioning for different expected specific fire loads. And the relevant area for this building is marked by this red square. However, the actual floor area was quite a lot larger. So what have we learned all together from this incident? We found that the fire design had shortcomings when it comes to load bearing capacities and sectioning, and possibly also when it comes to extinguishing systems. We see that it's quite important to have a holistic philosophy when it comes to safety. And by this, I mean, there were quite a few contradicting arguments in the fire safety uh, philosophy here. And it sort of shows that an overall or holistic approach was missing. For example, the size of the car, car park was used as an argument for fire alarm systems. But at the same time, it's argued that a fire will not spread to other vehicles, causing reduced load bearing capacities. So yeah, uh, try to avoid uncritical reuse of content from older fire engineering concepts. It's quite important. We also see that the Norwegian regulation re regarding wall openings need to be revised and that there's a need for an evaluation on how the degree and geometry of openings can affect the fire development. A fire a parking garage of this kind, when it's located so closely to key societal infrastructure, cannot be just seen as any car park standing alone on a, uh, yeah, a field. Uh, you have an adjacent infrastructure and therefore you must consider the consequences uh, for an adjacent infrastructure and buildings. And we found that the multi-story car park should have been placed in fire class four because of its proximity to key infrastructure. And we see that sometimes when regulation changes are made, changes are not necessarily emphasized by the authorities, so it can be a little bit difficult to navigate. So we recommend that higher emphasis is made on which changes are made from one regulation set to the next. When it comes to conclusion and learning points for other aspects, there is quite a lot in our report regarding learning points from the firefighting efforts. So please have a look at the report on the next slide if you want to have a look at that. And when it comes to electric vehicles, observations during the fire indicate that electric vehicles did not contribute to the fire development beyond what is expected from conventional vehicles. And we saw that there was a limited environmental impact from the fire, from the extinguishing foam and also from the smoke. There are two reports 
uh, one in Norwegian and one in English, available at 3safi.com slash publications. So please have a read there if you are interested in that. This presentation here is a part of Frick Project 1-2, Learning from Fire Investigations. And Frick is funded by the Research Council of Norway, as well as Frick Partners. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, welcome to ask questions if you have any. <laughs>